Hi, this is Joel Hagenberg, and welcome to Not Only Witches. In this episode, I will be discussing William Bradford. William Bradford was the second governor of Plymouth Colony. He was born in around 1590 and died in 1657. Governor Bradford was also a signer of the Mayflower Compact and the author of the History of Plymouth Plantation. Governor Bradford, like the other pilgrims who came over to North America on the Mayflower, was an English separatist. Governor Bradford was married twice, first to Dorothy May, who died in 1620. Now, Dorothy died of mysterious circumstances as she fell off the Mayflower off the coast of Cape Cod and drowned. Historians still are unsure of what caused her death. After the death of his first wife, Governor Bradford married a second time to Alice Carpenter. Governor Bradford and Alice Carpenter had many children. The most prominent of these children was their son, William Bradford Jr., who eventually became Lieutenant Governor of Plymouth Colony. William Bradford Jr., would go on to marry Alice Richards. Alice Richards' story is quite interesting, as she was the daughter of Thomas Richards and Wealthy and Loring Richards. Wealthy and Loring Richards was accused of witchcraft in 1653 or 54 in Wenham, Massachusetts, which had previously been a part of Salem. And while Wealthy and Loring was not accused of witchcraft in the Salem Witch Trials, as she had been deceased for about 15 years or so, her son, John Richards, was involved in the Salem Witch Trials. He was a magistrate on both the courts of Oye and Termine and the Superior Court of Judicature. This meant that John Richards was directly involved in all those who were convicted and executed during the Salem Witch Trials. A large number of Americans are descended both from William Bradford Sr., as well as Wealthy and Loring Richards. So there is a pretty good percentage that anyone listening to this podcast is descended from, whether directly or indirectly, an accused witch or witch accuser either in witch trials prior to Salem or during Salem. Now let's get back to Governor William Bradford. Being that he was governor of Plymouth Colony, he was naturally involved in many of the events, including the first Thanksgiving and the peaceful, at the time, interactions with the local Native American tribes. It is commonly believed at this point, that the Native Americans and the Mayflower passengers had some serious issues with each other. That's not entirely true, as Governor Bradford's generation had quite positive relations with the Native American tribes. It was the generation after them that was involved in many of the Indian Wars or Native American Wars. The most famous of these in New England is the King Philip's War. Now, King Philip was not actually a king. He was the son of Massasoit, who was of the same generation that Governor Bradford was from. The son's name was Metacom, or Metacomet. He fought against the second generation of Mayflower passengers, such as William Bradford Jr. Historically, these times were quite separate. However, in modern times, the King Philip's War and the Mayflower landing are very much smushed together. So it makes it seem as though 
it escalated much quicker than it actually did in a negative way. There is no argument, however, that things did escalate, and it was not positive. If you can trace your family tree back to colonial New England, there is a very high probability that you are descended from someone who fought in the King Philip's War, which was fought around New England. You'll also probably be descended from wars that took place prior to that and after that. The histories that are written of these white settlers in various places, such as Stonington, Connecticut, or Plymouth, or Salem, any of these local towns in New England. What's unfortunate is that we have very little records from the Native American tribes, such as the Pequots or the Wampanoags or the Mohegans around this time. So it's quite difficult to determine how they viewed certain instances, which means we, for the most part, only can go off the written records of the colonial white males. This does not necessarily make the accounts wrong. They could very well be very wrong. We just have no way of knowing. When history is written by the victors, as it usually is, of course, there's going to be some biases. So you have to take most written records of the time with a grain of salt. But that could be true with any era of history. Historically, the only people who had voices that hardly anyone would listen to were going to be white males. So women hardly had voices. The Native Americans hardly had voices. Any minority groups in whichever country you're discussing had little to no voice. That's why historians tend to use a phrase that to some has a negative connotation, but I don't believe it should. The rewriting of history, because of the lack of voices from a lot of groups, it is necessary to go back and see if you can uncover new source material to add to the story that's already been written. And if enough information is discovered, it may actually change the story. They're not simply going in with modern thoughts, or they should not be, at least, going in there with their modern thoughts and just changing it so it's more culturally acceptable to today. Historically, people thought very differently than we did. A lot of things that they did back then, we would think are absolutely insane today. There's a lot of things that we do that they would probably think that are insane. So it's kind of difficult to judge the past in that way, where we live in a totally different world. Obviously, there are very bad things that have occurred in the past, such as slavery and, you know, Indian removal and terrible things such as those. But for the most part, it's very difficult to judge the past. Yes, we're humans but we thought very differently. That being said, the writings of colonial settlers, such as Governor William Bradford, are interesting reads. Sometimes they are quite difficult to decipher, but they are written in English as opposed to documents further back, so they're not that difficult. They did use words that sound more like legal documents today, but that's neither here nor there. Given that these are some of the only documents we have to go off of from the time period, as primary source material goes, it is worth giving them a read to see what you can learn. And just, while reading, just know that you have to try to take the biases of yourself out of it and think about the biases that they may have had whilst writing these documents. Both of those things can be challenging. It's hard to be objective as the reader, 
when you know that the person writing the document may not have been objective. However, we must do our best. I personally am much more well-versed in the colonial writings of the time period and the revolutionary period and even some of the documents going back to England. I am not one to speak on Native American documents if they do exist as I don't speak the language. So I think it would be a disservice for me to do too many episodes on that particular group of people. I know there are definitely some Native American podcasters that definitely do a much better job than I could on that topic. So I'm going to stick to what I know, which is going to be the colonial North America. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. If you did, can you please recommend this podcast to your friends and family? Please subscribe, and thank you for listening.